we see today that there are certain people that willing to give their life for a specific mitzvah, a commandment. We have 613 commandments. More than half of them relates to sacrifices in the time of the temple. Since we don't have the temple, it doesn't apply. Uh, but we find that the mitzvot, the commandments that are still relevant to our generation, some of them are more desirable by certain people. Sometimes you find a person that is very, very good with charity, he's very generous, he's focusing on it, he's putting all his efforts to give as much as he can to people that need his help. Sometimes you find a person that is very, very strict with uh, praying. He prays he, instead of one hour, he prays three hours, he has patience, he's praying with tears and great uh, intentions and all, you know, and that you see that this is the mitzvah that is very great at. The story of this Yemenite woman, her name is Margalit Bat Avraham Gamliel, that she came to Israel about 60, 70 years ago before Israel even became a state. And uh, when she came from Yemen with all the Yemenites immigrant, uh, they gave her a medical ex uh, exam and they checked her health. And since she had a rash, uh, the doctors were kind of primitive. They decided that she had leprosy, even though it's a very, very rare uh, sickness to our days. It used to be more common uh, two or three thousand years ago. But she uh, was examined and they decided that she has a leprosy and they sent her to Yerushalayim to a special place uh, in a neighborhood called Talabiya and they put her in an isolated hospital. She was put in a locked room and the doctors and the nurse over there took care of her with special uh, gloves and uh, faces covered not to, uh, not to get it from her because it's contagious. This is a single woman that was completely healthy. She was diagnosed uh, by mistake, in error, that uh, she has leprosy. And basically, they finished her life. From the moment that she got there, obviously, she can't get married. She can't be, meet anyone. She's basically isolated for the rest of her life. One other thing, when she came from Yaman, she had an antique Sefer Torah, the Torah scroll that she bought from Yaman. She got it from her grand-grand-grandparents. It passed from generation to generation. Handmade Torah antique that's perhaps worth millions of dollars. The people of the Zionist agency that were dealing with the immigrants, they took advantage on naivety and they told her, you can trust us, you, we'll keep it for you when you be healthy, when you come out, you come to us, you, you, you come to that place, we'll give it back to you knowing she'll never come out. And that's how they stole the Sefer Torah from her. As she was there in the hospital, the people around her testified that she never ever complained about the doctors who sent her to this hospital and destroyed her life. Now she really got leprosy because she got it from the other patients over there. Now for sure she cannot come out. But all she cared about is the Sefer Torah that they stole from me. That's all she was complaining about. After a while, she decided that since she lost this mitzvah of Sefer Torah, she was so proud of having it, she will rewrite the Sefer Torah. Since she doesn't know how to write, she has to pay money for a sofer to write it. So she started to save money from the budget. That she was getting some money from the government. So she started to put the money aside until she had enough money. She hired the Yemenite sofer to write the Sefer Torah. She sent him the money with a letter, write me the Sefer Torah. And two, maybe one or two years later, the Sefer Torah was ready. And she donated that Sefer Torah on her name, on her behalf, to a Yemenite yeshiva, a Yemenite synagogue. And they made a big party. They got the Sefer Torah in. And she made a party to all the patients in the hospital. She was very, very happy. She felt like she's born again. About a year later, this place where we received the Sefer Torah got burned completely with the Sefer Torah in it. So here again, she's back to square one. She lost the Sefer Torah again. Obviously, now her heart is completely broken. It affected her mentally, and she started to become more sick. And as she's not doing so well, she decided that she must write another Sefer Torah. 
So she wrote a letter to the government describing her situation. They told her that she wants to borrow money from them. Uh, she needs enough money to write a Sefer Torah today. We're talking more than $20,000. And uh, she wants to borrow money that to be able to write Sefer Torah again. So they answer her, what guarantee you are going to give us? How are you going to pay the loan? So she said, you don't have to send me any more monthly checks. Just take everything towards the loan you're going to give me. You give me X amount of money, every month you deduct it until I, fi I finish paying you. Surprisingly, they agree to give it to her. It's a miracle that they agree such a thing. And they decided to give her the money. They gave her the money. She sent the girl the money to the sofer and he wrote a Sefer Torah. And this time the Sefer Torah went in to a place that needed it. And Baruch Hashem, with God's help, it stayed there. One time, one of the rabbis came to visit her. And uh, when he came to the hospital, you know, they stand by the window, she's there, they see what's going on inside. You see the nurse is coming and talking to her and the nurse is telling her, you know, you're really a fool. What benefit you got by taking all your money, your monthly budget, sending it to this rabbi to write another Sefer Torah, and now you're left without a penny. You don't have money. Look at your socks. It's all ripped. You don't have clothes. Your clothes are all pieces. Uh, you're suffering so much with your situation just for that. So that was her answer. And we have a lot to learn from this woman. That's why I'm bringing this story for each one of us to wake up. She told her, when I came from Yemen to this country, I had dreams to get married here with a Jewish guy, to have children, grandchildren. House of Torah, house of mitzvot, commandments. I left with nothing. I left without a husband, without a kid, without anything. If there is anything I can leave after my death in this life, what impression would I leave? I was isolated in a place, cannot see light, cannot see nothing. If anything I can leave in this life, is this Sefer Torah that after I leave here, I come in front of God and I'll be proud. Something I did for the nation of Israel and for the world. You wanted me not to do it? What do I need? Will I take socks or my outfit and this is what I'm going to show God, that this is what I had in life? I rather give up the socks. I rather give up the clothes. I rather be the way I am as long as I know in the end the Satan did not surrender me. They took away my first Sefer Torah, they took away the second one, but the third one I made it, and that's what it's all about. So when this story was said to Rabbi Yashiv, the, the chief rabbi in the Ashkenazi world, 101 years old, and he, this, he said that this woman deserve, deserve to be called the, guard, the, the Shomrei HaTorah, that she's like, uh, we have a, in Simcha Torah, a holiday that we say, one person is Chatan Torah, like, uh, like the groom that is marrying to the Torah, is like the one is making a party for him. And this is a male, and she's a female. She says she's, she deserves to be Kalata Torah, the bride of the Torah. Thank you very much.